Grazie, buongiorno a tutti. Uh, è sempre un piacere per me uh, tornare a Roma. Sono stato qua negli anni Ottanta, quando un certo Bettino Craxi ha tentato di, ha riuscito finalmente a riformare la scala mobile. Uh, quindi quando vedo sciopero generale 12 dicembre, quando vedo la manifestazione di ieri, mi è molto familiare. Uh, non è che tutto cambia, soprattutto qua a Roma. Adesso parlerò in, ingle in inglese. Uh, un po' per quello, it's always a pleasure to return to Rome, uh, precisely because some things never changed. Uh, I dissipated a part of my youth here in a trance of happiness, and I find that happiness, particularly on a beautiful day like this, still accessible. As we grow older, memory grows in importance. It's a labyrinth of possibility. So much of life today is jolting and restless, and I find that a measure of dilatory inefficiency becomes quite comforting. The transactional relationships of London or New York or Singapore give way to human relationships here in Rome. People actually take a few seconds to look at each other, and they actually chat without any specific purpose. Rush on, world, the voice of Rome seems to murmur. Ambition will founder, conquest will unravel, riches will be lost, power will be dissipated, palaces will crumble, and you will be left, all illusions exhausted at last, to find comfort in beauty, family, your corner of the city, and a steaming plate of Bucatini alla Maciciana. Of course, it was di Lampedusa who observed that everything must change so that everything stays the same. But here I sometimes feel that everything must stay the same so that one or two things can actually change. Uh, the city clocks, unlike when I lived here 30 years ago, some of them actually do function now. Prime Minister Matteo Renzi, aged 39, what would Giulio Andreotti think of that? <laughs> is a revolutionary politician. His youth, direct language, dynamism, and relative transparency have shaken up old habits. I find something of the young Tony Blair about him. He's a showman pushing change through force of character. His ambition for Italy, he has said, is not to do better than Greece, but to do better than Germany. Well, those are fighting words. That would be transformational. This country needs a jolt. Renzi's slogan, in effect, is change or die. I wish the young leader luck. Three recessions in six years is too much. Still, I always find Rome's reminder of the constancy of things useful. A quarter century on from the fall of the Berlin Wall, we see how deluded we were to imagine, even for a moment, that the old battles of nation states and rival ideologies would give way to a world driven by enlightened self-interest and the shared embrace, universal embrace, of Western liberal democracy and the rule of law as the model by which all of humanity would live by. Well, as we know, it was not to be. Al-Qaeda, Vladimir Putin, the Chinese Communist Party, they all thought otherwise. Powers still do what they do. They seek to advance their interests, accumulate resources, increase their wealth at the expense of others if necessary. Beheadings and plague have not been banished from the world. But the balance of forces looks different. Change is undeniable, even viewed from Rome. We should not exaggerate it, but we cannot dismiss it. The world seems to be, as some of the earlier speakers here were saying, at some kind of tipping point. I have not felt so uneasy about the state of the world at any other time in my life. It's not just the centennial of World War I this year that reminds us of how, in unimagined ways, a small spark, like the one in Sarajevo in 1914, can lead to a vast conflagration. No, I think that reminder is also there in a fraying global system. The post-1945 order 
Pax Americana, if you will, with the United States at its epicenter, is giving way to something far more diffuse, its nature undefined, and its stability far from assured. I have called this in a column the age of unraveling, the age of unraveling. Technological cyber integration is, is accompanied by strategic and political disintegration. The one fires the other to some degree. Nationalism is a reaction to a borderless cyber world. Conflictual polities and collaborative networks coexist. Look at what happened to the Arab Spring, an example of how networks can power uprisings. In the end, old politics, old power politics, managed to stifle to a very large degree the hope of that spring. Why? Because in the end, those old policies, those old systems were better organized. So let me briefly look at some of the elements of this age of unraveling. Well, clearly, first of all, a new great power, China, China, is rising. That is disruptive. Historically, as you know, the transition from one major power to another has rarely been accomplished in a peaceful manner. The great question of our day, in a way, as Henry Kissinger put it, is whether, quote, perhaps for the first time in history, a rising state can be incorporated into the international system to strengthen peace and progress without some major and violent upheaval. A second element, of course, is that my country, the United States, is war scarred. It's scarred by what? By two unwon wars. It's turning inward. Retrenchment is the word generally used for this. A Pew survey of America's place in the world this year found that currently 52% of Americans say that the United States should mind its own business internationally and let other countries get along the best they can on their own. To heck with the world, in other world. To heck with them all. We've tried in Afghanistan, in Iraq. We reacted to 9-11, sometimes in reckless ways, but we were trying to preserve Western values, and people didn't appreciate it. So to heck with them. And just 38% disagree with that statement that we should mind our own business. And this is the most lopsided balance in favor of the US minding its own business in the 50-year history of that survey. Moreover, as was mentioned uh, in the previous speech, Washington is not a particularly edifying sight these days. Uh, Craig Kennedy, as we were walking over here through the beautiful streets of Rome, uh, described the city as feeling somewhat lost I hadn't heard that word before, but it struck me. There's political gridlock, partisanship, politics often seems like the hostage of money. The checks and balances of the founding fathers have morphed into an unbalanced checkmate. And the economy is still working its way through the fallout of the meltdown of 2008. And then we have the question of leadership. We have the Obama factor. We're talking about the disorder in the West. What is the West? Well, the West has always been America-led. And when you don't get strong leadership in the White House, whatever the global forces, like the rise of China or the restive mood in Russia today, whatever those forces may be, leadership, in the end, is critical. And that's one reason why we should be cautious. If leadership changes, things could also change. But I think the president has made some significant mistakes. Uh, Syria, obviously, is an important one. When the President of the United States says, as President Obama said early in the Syrian conflict, that President Assad is history. He is going. It is over. He will not be here. And he pronounces those words without having any strategic plan whatsoever to achieve that objective. That is a matter of great gravity. It is equally a matter of great gravity when the President of the United States sets a red line for the use of chemical weapons in Syria, marches the Allies up the hill in preparation for a response to the use of those chemical weapons, sends his Secretary of State out to make a moving speech in preparation for that action, and then goes for a walk in the Rose Garden 
and decides, no, I don't think so. After all, I'm not going to do that. It is a matter of gravity when the President of the United States says, I have no strategy for ISIS. It is a matter of gravity when the President of the United States says, maybe we can hit singles, maybe we can hit doubles, but don't imagine that the President of the United States or that America still has the power to hit the ball out of the park. It is a matter of gravity, I think, when don't do stupid stuff becomes the paradigm of American foreign policy. That is not sufficient. And I would argue that there is a link between this perceived weakness in the White House and what we have witnessed over the past year that has been so alarming. President Putin's annexation of Crimea, his stirring up of a nasty little war in the eastern part of Ukraine. I covered the war in Bosnia. It reminds me a lot on a bigger scale in a way, on a more dangerous scale, of what President Milosevic did in Bosnia in 1992. The rise of Islamic State and the way it has swept across the border of Syria into Iraq. The recent Chinese assertiveness in the South and East China Seas, which has alarmed Japan, alarmed Vietnam, alarmed the Philippines. China asserting its rights in, in territorial, what it claims are its territorial waters, and others, of course, dispute that. I don't think you can divorce all that and just say it's some, well, it's some coincidence. They all, all these things just happen to have occurred this year. No, they occurred because people see weakness. When they see that the United States, the word of the United States, the treaty obligations even of the United States seem to be called in question, they say, okay, there's opportunity here. We can move. We can do things. And the reaction is likely to be muted. It is likely not to alarm us, it is likely to allow us to get away with it. I mean, if you ask who are the dynamic leaders in the world today, you might hear Modi, Prime Minister Modi of India. You might hear President Putin. You might hear President Xi of China. I think these are the three names that would come to mind, not perhaps the President of the United States. So there is, in this disorder in the West that we're talking to, about today, a central issue that we should debate over the course of the day, over the credibility of American power, and how important that is to gathering the West again into being a more effective force in this new age. A third point I would like to make, and I've touched on it, uh, concerns Russia. Um, I think for uh, the last quarter century, since the fall of the Berlin Wall, there was a general assumption that with zigzags, with changes, Russia would gradually integrate with the West. That was the direction of things. It might be more pronounced under President Medvedev than under President Putin, but that was the direction things were going. Interdependence was growing. Russia came into the group of eight leading industrialized countries. It's now, of course, been expelled from there for now. Modernity would do its work, bre breeding openness and connectedness, and, and Russia would move in our direction. Today we have to say we were wrong. It's not the case. President Putin has decided on another course. He's opted for confrontation, limited confrontation perhaps, but still confrontation with the West as the basis for Russian development and the consolidation of his power. We may speculate as to why, maybe the street protests in Moscow in 2011, what happened in Libya, this sense of American weakness, the upheaval in Ukraine, maybe he's simply his inner KGB officer uh, asserting himself. We all laughed when Putin said that the collapse of the Soviet Union had been the greatest geostrategic disaster of the 20th century. Well, maybe we should have taken that more seriously. In the end, the reasons are secondary to the reality. Putin has changed direction and ignited a wave of Russian nationalism. And this was the backdrop to the annexation of Crimea and that war in Ukraine. And we need to be seriously worried in the West, in my view, about what is happening in Moscow. This wave of nationalism, the way that Putin has described the people in Kiev as fascists spreading anti-Semitism. This is grotesque. This has no bearing on reality. If anything, the extreme right forces that we're seeing are in Moscow. They are not in Kiev. Now, I don't think this is a second Cold War. 
but it is the end of a Western illusion. Cooperation is still possible. There's signs of some helpfulness from Russia and Iran. But the, the Europe and the United States and the West have a big challenge before them, and that's to frame a policy to Moscow, toward Moscow that's effective, that somehow resists, restrains, and at the same time retains Russia. Europe, I think, has a hard time conceiving of its security with reason without Russia in the mix somehow. And the final uh, element, I think, is, and this again was touched upon, is the fraying of the European US, the transatlantic bond. I'm a transatlanticist to the core. I think it's critically important, and it saddens me. But there is a fraying, and it's partly to do with economic weakness. It's partly to do with um, the NSA scandal, certainly in countries like Germany. Uh, there's a sense of disgruntlement in Europe, and that is tied uh, to the state of the economy. And in the United States, you have a recovery that has not really helped the middle class. There's a sense of disillusionment. And we need to find a new impulsion, whether this comes in part from TTIP, the new trade pact between Europe and the United States. I think it'll have a lot to do with Germany defining a more effective foreign policy, particularly in its relations with China. Uh, but we have to address this. Uh, and the result of all this is you know, the phrase nobody's world has been used. There's a kind of a vacuum. And vacuums, as you know, are dangerous. A couple of final thoughts. We say America is retreating from the world. But there's something absolutely fundamental in the American character that doesn't like that. America is an idea. America is an idea. It cannot be separated from the idea that it is. And the idea of America, at some fundamental level, is still that of being a beacon. Often people in Europe and elsewhere don't like American exceptionalism, uh, even when they benefit from it, benefited from it. But it is there, this notion that the spread of a liberal order, of democracy, of the rule of law, of liberty, of freedom, uh, this is intrinsic. Uh, to the American idea. And even though you might think that President Obama would be popular for interpreting the American wish to withdraw from Iraq, to withdraw from Afghanistan, to go in for this uh, retrenchment that I described, that's not in fact the case. His foreign policy is the single most unpopular element of his policies. Why is this? Because something deep in the American does not uh, like this idea. And I think, I think that is important because the American presence in the world is still critically important. In Asia, it's the best guarantee against a Sino-Japanese war and Japan going nuclear. It's the best guarantee that nations including Vietnam, the Philippines, and Singapore profit from China's rise rather than being squashed from it. It's the best guarantee that India's rise and China's can accompany each other. And it's important still for Europe, critically important for Europe, given what we are seeing to the east of Europe these days. Uh, the United States has enduring strengths. It's relatively young. Its demographics are good. Uh, it's moving towards energy self-sufficiency. There's a manufacturing revival. Its soft power is unrivaled. Look at Silicon Valley. Look at all the brands we use day after day. Creativity and the capital behind it to make it effective. All these things uh, do not speak for American decline. As Lee Kuan Yew once observed, China can draw on a talent pool of 1.3 billion people, but the US can draw on the world's 7 billion people and recombine them in a diverse culture that exudes creativity. So I'm not an American declinist, but we have to be realistic about uh, the new balances in the world. Two final thoughts. One is, what can we do in the West that really would make a difference and that would alter in some way this sense of, of powerlessness, of disorder, of danger uh, that I've tried to describe? I think one very, very important and central thing that the West could do. And there's no substitute for the West. Nobody's about to step into the West's shoes. China's not ready for prime time, nor is India. 
Nobody is itching to take over this role. This is something we should bear in mind today. If not the West, who? I mean, maybe in 2050, maybe in 2075, but not now. It's critical for the West to rethink itself because there is no viable alternative right now, even if the West is operating in a changed setting. But I think the West must push very hard over the next few months to finish and conclude this deal with Iran. It's not perhaps a Nixon to China moment, but Iran is the only top 20 economy in the world that is not integrated with the world. Here is a country of 80 million people, many of them highly educated, four million Iranian kids in college, overwhelmingly pro-Western and pro-American beneath the leadership. If we can bring Iran into the world, if we can get over uh, this nuclear uh, confrontation and find a deal that ushers Iran into the world, that is going to be very important. And it will be an important indication of how the West has to operate these days. We're not going to change the Islamic Republic overnight. We're not going to substitute it with some Jeffersonian democracy. But we in the West must learn to work with systems that are different from ours and believe that over time our values can have influence if there is connectedness. That is why it is so important to bring all these young people of Iran toward the world and conclude this deal. So I would urge us all, in whatever way we can, through the influence we can have on the Congress, on Montecitorio, on our politicians, to stress that we believe that this deal is in, in, in the interest of the West and of the whole world. It can be transformative in a lot of significant ways. In short, the West must rediscover its self-belief. That's impossible without economic revival and addressing issues of gross inequality. But if the West leads by example and harnesses its message of openness and life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness to the new technologies linking the world, it can win out in the end against the new authoritarianisms, just as Italy, in the end, won its drawn-out post-war battle for democracy and stability. Thank you.